All right, guys, so we finished up today getting the engine in. Um, we've pretty much fully dressed all the components that were necessary to put on before we got the engine in the truck. Um, yeah, last video, or the last part you saw was us timing the engine, so everything's timed. We're ready to pretty much just start with intercooler piping, which we've got the bottom piece on here. It attaches to the lower, or the motor mount on the engine block here. Timing cover's on, oil filler's on, and then this is the custom bracket. It'll be similar to one that you can get at Joel from, uh, or Jonesy's Automotive. Um, might be able to figure out sourcing that from the person I bought it from as well. We decided to top clock the turbo upwards. So we just basically rotated the entire exhaust manifold 180 degrees. Uh, just cause we think it looks a little bit cooler that way. We're gonna have to figure out a little bit of intercooler piping here, but I think we have all we need. And if not, we can get some more silicone. Um, we'll just have a 90 here going down to the intercooler piping that we did on that previous video uh, with intercooler piping that we drilled through and welded into the cross member. Um, I believe AC goes here. No. Yeah, AC goes here. Alternator will go here. Um, there's the water neck uh, inlet or outlet. Out. Outlet. And then here's the inlet where the radiator go or will come from, obviously. Uh, sensors, we've got a water sensor here. And then we also have one way in the back, which you can't see. That's why we put it in before doing the install. There's two uh, bungs there. One's for uh, your heater, and then the other is for uh, another temperature sensor. One we'll use for AC cutoff, which I believe is that one. And then the one back here is for the, uh, the gauge on the dash. Um, this is the uh, intercooler piping that's gonna go down to the piece that I showed you before. I'll show you that a little bit later. Uh, vacuum pumps installed. The way that the uh, throttle cable is going to work is really cool actually. So we're going to utilize the stock Toyota one that's coming from the firewall over there. And then we have this little bracket here on the P-pump that's a universal bracket. It's not all the way connected yet. There will be some linkage that will actually connect this. So this kind of just makes it a 180 right here and it fits almost perfectly as you can see. So I'll link that in the description if you guys want to buy that. It was about 150 bucks on eBay. Here we've got our um, fitting for our boost gauge in the, in the cab, which we'll set eventually. And then on this side, underneath the turbo, we have our uh, little bung for the EGT, which is a temperature or parameter sensor. So yeah, lots of success today. There's not much room in the back. We'll go over that more in detail, but it took a little bit of uh, finagling with the low leveler and deflating the tires using the 31s, not the 40s, which are back on it now. Um, but yeah, the engine mounts are in. We have to put the transmission in and address the cross member, transfer case, drive lines, all that kind of stuff. But for the most part, most of the work is done. Now it's kind of just buttoning everything up, adding fluids and uh, yeah, going for test drive and looking for leaks. So anyways, that's gonna do it for this video, guys. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe. If you didn't like it, put the thumbs down and unsubscribe. Anyways, thanks for watching and I'll see you on the trails. So what we're doing now is we're taking the Toyota Toyota, right? Mm -hmm. Toyota alternator and the Dodge alternator side by side, which appear to be relatively similar, but we have our electrical engineer here, which is going to help. Uh, what we're doing, I think, is swapping the voltage regulator, voltage regulator in the Toyota mm -hmm. with the Dodge, because we're going to end up using the Dodge for the Cummins swap, obviously. Um, but this is externally re uh, regulated, Correct. whereas this is internally regulated. And is that why we need the internals from this in there, or why do we need that? So the Toyota stuff is internally regulated right here, and the Dodge stuff uses the ECU to do it. And unless you want to change all the wiring harnesses on the cruiser, you can just take this and swap it so long as you're using the same kind of alternator, because Denso alternators use the same frame pretty much because like if you come over here and look at this they almost look the same the only real difference is like right here mm, yeah like the mounting points mm -hmm. or yeah, yeah and if you swivel. look at it from the top you can see all of the points where the windings are hooked up are basically identical they use the same shaft size they use the same brushes and so we can just take them off like this and then fiddle around with it to get the brushes in there and then set it down like that and now yeah, it fits perfectly yeah, that's so crazy exactly how 
a Toyota, and I guess, like you said, they're Denso, mm -hmm. so they're manufactured similarly, but um, pretty cool. Another cool little asterisk part of the swap. Mm -hmm. And now everything is going to be just like factory. We'll just plug it in, and it'll charge your batteries like normal. Nice. All right, so here we have the Dodge alternator with the Toyota, say, internals, or however you want to classify this, the voltage regulator. Voltage regulator. Um, what we also did is we noticed that the brushes, where the brushes make contact on the stator shaft here, the shaft for the stator from the Dodge, you can see there's a little, there's quite a bit of wear. So we actually took the full Toyota one apart and used the Toyota, where well, you can't see now, but that race is a lot cleaner. So we took the whole shaft out and uh, swap yeah, the swap the bearings. We looked at getting a new, a whole new alternator, but there's a hundred and a smod bucks. So uh, yeah, so that's a win. All right, so because of the whole buy once, cry once thing and a sale that Power Driven Diesel had on a few pieces of their uh, equipment, I went and purchased the 60-pound uh, valve springs to work in conjunction with the 3 and 4K valve, I'm sorry, 4K governor springs that we installed. Um, these are really necessary uh, so that basically the I'll do a comparison when I get the stock ones out. These provide a little bit more... Um, uh, tensile strength, whatever you call it, they, they, they're, they're a little bit stiffer compared to the stock ones. And what that's going to uh, do is prevent a uh, valve float because there's really only about 30 to 50 thou, I think of uh, clearance or tolerance between the valves and the piston. Um, it's an interference engine where as the one FZ is not where you could snap your timing chain or, you know, you could lose a pulley and the valves won't come into contact with the piston. So this engine will, so these were like 200 bucks. Um, obviously we've already assembled the engine, the heads on. So they have this cool little in chassis valve spring compressor. Uh, it basically just bolts into one of the, uh, rocker pedestal bolt holes. And then it allows you to, um, get your existing valve springs off by pushing them down, uh, getting the keepers out and putting your new ones in. can slowly release it and hopefully the valves won't fall through hopefully it they, is a top dead center they should have fallen already that's true yeah they would have fallen already if we weren't because there's nothing holding them down now so now can we do this five more times successfully is the question because <laughs> if we don't if we get one of them wrong the head's got to come off so. with the power of video editing it will all be correct yes exactly you'll never know <laughs> and get the yeah just like that don't have to take it all the way apart Jeez, those are fucking tall. <laughs> yeah. All right, so there you have the power-driven diesel uh, in-chassis valve spring compressor with the 60-pound valve spring. So now we're getting very close to putting the engine back in the truck, but because of the lack of area that I'm going to have in this firewall here with the P-pump, I want to make sure it's timed correctly. So we've already done that method that I've showed you, and you can see up in there. It's that little tooth right there is the flag indicating that the p-pump is timed for top dead center so what we have here on the front is our timing wheel all right so i've just taken a bolt in the timing cover and gotten it lined up with the zero or top dead center we remember we already know that the crank was timed at top dead center and i just tightened this down instead of tightening these in order to remove because we actually need to loosen it we're retarding the timing so what we're doing is we're we're timed without the gear on the uh, p-pump at top dead center which is 12 and a half degrees because I looked at my timing cover and this year was a 92. I'm not going to be able to get this to focus. Anyways, all of your information's right here. This is 12 and a half degrees. So if we're at top dead center here, we want to add eight degrees, seven to eight degrees um, to it. So we want to get up to like 18 degrees. Let's say, let's say we'll add six degrees. So we're actually going to go eight degrees retarding this, which means it's going to give more time for the fuel pump to inject fuel into the cylinders before firing. What that does is it decreases your EGT and gives it more, it basically wakes your engine up a little bit. So we're gonna retard this eight degrees and then we're gonna come back two degrees to take all the gear lash out so that we get an accurate reading for our top dead center. 
in lieu of using these, because we can't loosen them, they're just gonna untorque or un unbolt. We're gonna use a barring tool in the back. The barring tool basically just inserts these uh, splines into the flywheel and we're going to tighten it so that the the flywheel is spinning counterclockwise if we're looking at the engine from the front which is going to retard the engine this way yeah now it's gone it's gonna take a while you're at like oh that's right that's you're at like two degrees okay. keep going like just go I'll... it's so much easier yeah <laughs> You're at like seven. <laughs> Ten. <laughs> okay, that's, that's probably enough. Just a hair. Little, right there. So our gear for the P-Pump is back on uh, with the washer, the crush washer, uh, and the 30 mil nut. Um, we made a mark where top dead center should be for that and then indexed it with the correct uh, mark also on the cam. Um, so then we're going to take, we took the crankshaft pulley off, we'll put the timing cover on, uh, make sure that when you ugga dugga that, do it with an impact wrench, not not a torque or a, any type of regular socket because then you're going to change your, your P-pump. Make sure that you have your plastic flag out of here because I broke it if you remember, I was lucky enough to retrieve it 